Okay, and we are live. How's it going, everybody? My name is Todd Anderson with AV Nirvana, and thanks for joining us tonight. This is our fourth official AV Nirvana live episode, and tonight we have two really cool guests from Surge X. They are experts on surge protection, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to dig a little bit into why you should avoid MOV surge protectors if you can. And uh, of course, we're going to be talking about series mode technologies and how that protects your favorite equipment in your home theater room. And uh, if you're joining us live tonight, please feel free to drop into the chat room and ask a question or leave a comment, and we'll try to address those as those come along. So our two guests tonight are Vince Luciani. He's a senior sales engineer with SurgeX, and Jimmy Paschke is director of sales at SurgeX. And just a little background on both of these gentlemen, because their credentials are really impressive. Uh, Vince has been with SurgeX since 2019, serving as a senior sales engineer, following his tenure as an independent consultant engineer, where he designed electronics for uh, consumer, uh, consumer electronics, automotive, audio, and power management industries. He also helped to create the HDMI cable testing protocol for DPL laboratories. And uh, Vince began his career as a design engineer creating cinema audio products for smart theater systems and most recently held a position of chief technology and analytics officer for Enavolt Incorporated. Uh, his education background includes a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from NC State, home of the Wolfpack, and uh, a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering and Audio Electronics and Acoustics from Georgia Institute of Technology. And Jimmy's been with SurgeX for eight years. I've actually had a chance to meet Jimmy uh, multiple times on the uh, the floor of Cedia. I know he has no memory of that because there are thousands of people rolling through there, but he's a super nice guy uh, to, to meet in person. Um, he has over 20 years of retail training, installation sales, and management experience covering consumer electronics and custom integration. Former positions include national sand sales trainer at Sony, along with sales management positions at Acoustic Innovations, Kaleidoscape, a favorite of ours, uh, also Sound United. Uh, he's also served as director of CI for Core Brands and Panamax Furman. And uh, Jimmy has a Bachelor of Science, uh, Political Science and Communication from FSU. So let me bring uh, Jimmy and Vince aboard here. Welcome, gentlemen. Can you hey. hear me okay? Oh, yeah. yeah. Hello. Yes, here can, he can hear you great. And uh, yeah, so we, I, I just want to first of all thank you guys for taking time out of uh, your evening. You, you know, be preferable, I think, for everyone to do this during the day, but the evening time is when we can catch the most viewers and it's probably easiest for people to hop on here and listen to you live. But uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Yeah, cool. Glad to be here. And uh, Vince has been kind enough to bring along a, a uh, presentation to help kind of guide our, our discussion along. And uh, guys, I'm hoping tonight that, you know, we can start to identify some of the, the issues that sh people should be looking out for in terms of power, but also get some guidance on what they should be looking for when it comes to purchasing uh, surge protection for their home theater equipment. Very good. Very good. Well, you know, I think for, for, for me, you know, uh, this graphic right here kind of sums up the whole, the whole, uh, 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 situation we have, right. Uh, the name of the game when it comes to, you know, our AV partners out there is, you know, saving money on service calls and having their equipment available to their end user, to their customer, you know, when the, you know, when the customer calls you on Monday morning, because the, uh, the, the system went down during the Saturday football game and, uh, and, you know, and, uh, embarrass them in front. We've had that story happen one time where, <laughs> where a, uh, one of our, one of our, uh, integrators, um, got a, got a nasty phone call on Monday because the system didn't work over the weekend. Turn out oh, to be a power problem, but yeah. the kind of the chain we, I get asked quite often, you know, you know, where, where do these problems come from? So I kind of put this graphic together to, to kind of illustrate that. You know these power disturbances are are real they're out there um not only do the power companies um 
admit that there are power problems, right? Because of overuse of the grid. You know, I think, uh, we, well, you know, uh, Jimmy, I think somebody was telling us uh, in Florida, they haven't built a power plant in like 25 years or something like that. You wow. know, so they're, they're you know, the, the uh, 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 population gets larger and larger, but they don't, they, you know, uh, environmental lobbies don't allow uh, uh, people to, uh, or, or power companies to get more capacity. Hmm. That, that is one source of, of power issues, right? Lightning, as we know, is another port, uh, 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 you know, source of these power issues. And that's uh, probably one that people think of most when they think of a power surge is a you lightning know, I, think, I think that's the one that gets the most press, right? That's the one that we all see. We see lightning happen and we see the lights blink and that kind of stuff. But um, we have tools that are monitoring the, you know, the, the power all the time. And we can hmm. see that there's a lot more going on than just surge, right? And, you know, there's over voltages, there's voltage fluctuation issues, both in over voltages, under voltages, uh, uh, that kind of stuff. When it comes to surges, there's actually more than one source for surges. The one we know about and that we can see is lightning strikes, right? But right. Um, there's smaller surges that occur when when motors turn on and off and they back feed this back emf into uh, uh you know onto our our, our feeds when you're when you're uh, you know our power our, our, our uh, power feeds you know when you're when your air conditioner comes on and off you know sometimes hmm. you can actually see an issue right when your air conditioner comes on and your your lights kind of dim just 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 very quickly oh for but, sure you know those those are issues so i think we can all accept the fact that these power disturbances are real and they're out there. Mm -hmm. What kind of ties it together is uh, research that the mainly the semiconductor industry uh, uh, performed on what they refer to as electrical overstress. So basically, what happens is when you get a piece of equipment that uh, that that breaks, right? The piece of equipment goes back to the manufacturer. The manufacturer says, "Why did this thing break?" And they say, "Well, this semiconductor broke, right? This chip yeah. inside broke." For sure. Then they go back to the chip manufacturer and say, "Hey, why did this chip break? Right? And and, and you know why? You know what happened to it? And they find that most of the electrical overstress is due to the absolute maximum conditions that are that are specified in a data sheet, right? For these the, uh, semiconductors, they're being exceeded, right? And a lot of the times, it's because of these power disturbances, right? So they're they're stressing out these components." And these 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 failures are put into three categories. Uh, one of them is immediate end of life, right? And that is the one that we can get our head around, right? A lightning strike occurs, it, right. you know, it it, it uh, bombards the house, uh, your stereo system, your TV no longer works. Okay, that's the immediate end of life. Sure. The one in the middle is the one that kind of this electrical overstress uh, uh, research kind of you know sh shined a light on. And that is premature end of life. Uh, you know, our electronics that we use every day have a predictable lifespan. And for consumer electronics, it's more towards the seven year time frame. Uh, if it is more commercial electronics or industrial or medical equipment, it might be more in the 10 year time frame. But it all, it all comes down to the quality of the components that go inside and, you know, what dictates whether you're going to get a seven year product or a 10 year product, you know, kind of is, 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 is up to the manufacturer and what kind of components they want to use. You know, I, I'm sure we all have uh, people out there that have had a, uh, you know, for instance, a Macintosh amplifier that they've had for 25 years. Well, the reason why it's lasted 25 years, they use really, really high, high quality components in there. Right. Mm. But we've mm -hmm. also had cheap DVD players, right. That have, you know, that, that, after five years, they just they just crap out. Anyway, if it doesn't last as long as its predicted lifespan, that is called premature end of life. Okay, okay. so that that's definitely a malfunction issue. And then there's a third category, which is called lockups. Right, lockups are these nuisance issues that um, that occur, uh, you know, in a system. It doesn't necessarily mean anything's broken. It's, but, you know, I think, you know, the, the, your listeners out there, uh, you know, if they're pr predominantly, you know, one would think that they're integrators, right, listening to this show, they, they probably know this, right, where they go into a, a system, uh, it doesn't work, they turn everything off, 
wait 10 seconds, turn everything back on, and it starts to work. That's a, that's called a lockup issue. Hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And they, all three of those areas can be traced down to to uh, to, to power disturbances, and that that's really kind of the the, the, the crux of it all. That's really interesting. By the way, you know, when you talk about premature end of life and and cheap components, my mind immediately goes to LED light bulbs. I mean, so yeah. many of those have promised uh, twenty thousand hours of light, and you know they're they're crapping out after three years of use when you know they're not up to twenty thousand. But I'm just assuming it's the componentry inside. Yeah, well, you know that the the, you know if you if if you're using an LED light bulb that's in a 120 volt socket, inside that light bulb is a power supply that's turning the 120 volts AC into some DC value that is used for the for the LEDs. Mm -hmm. And um, most likely it's the power supply that is, you know, that's the thing, that's the front, you know, the front line that's taking the brunt of these power disturbances. And then most likely that's, that's what's uh, uh, blowing up. Okay, uh, just real quick, uh, I see on the, the pie chart there, you have neighboring building listed as uh, 20%. Is that meaning like your your neighbor's house can get, can be kicking a surge yeah. into your own home? Sure. My neighbor's got a, a welding shop. The other neighbor's got a wood <laughs> shop. You, you got motors driving, you know, neutral to ground noise up and... and yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because the one, one comment I've heard in my time at Panamax Furman and here at Surgex, so, you know, spanning 16, 17 years has been, um, oh, I'm, I'm good. I've got a dedicated 20 amp run to my two channel mm -hmm. system. So it's very clean. Right. And you know, that's a, a fallacy because there could be things going on inside your home, dishwasher turned on, other motors, other appliances, somebody's doing their, you know, blow drying their hair. If, if that's not going on in your home, then maybe your neighbor who shares the same transformer pole outside the home or the three or four neighbors or six to eight neighbors that are all sharing that pole, maybe they've got something going on that back feeds the noise in. So yeah, mm -hmm. that neighboring thing is, a, and maybe it's not even uh, residential. Maybe you're butting up against uh, some sort of commercial building. That's even uh -huh. worse. Yeah, Todd, I think I think one of the, one of the things that we, you know that, and, and again, I, I get this from talking to uh, you know to uh, uh, you know our our our, uh, our integration partners. You know, sometimes there there is there's those out there that think, okay, I've got this breaker panel and I got these breakers, and all of these are separate lines. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they're separate lines, but when those breakers are closed, all of the power is on the same circuit. All the power is together. So if you if you have a, you know, if your air conditioner turns on and pulls a huge current inrush and brings the voltage down, it's not only bringing the voltage down on the circuit that's going to the air conditioner, it's bringing down the voltage to the circuit on the entire panel and every mm -hmm. everything is connected. We, we know this, everyone on this, you know, conversation, in this conversation and probably anyone that would listen knows that that is the case when they've seen the lights and the home kind of dim and then come oh, back for sure. Up. When the yep. HVAC kicks on, yeah, 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 yep. and, and then and 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 Jimmy, you know, hit it right on the on the uh, on the on the head there. You know, the the way that power is distributed in the United States, you get a high voltage line that goes throughout the neighborhood, and then that high voltage line goes to a transformer that that knocks it down to you know the two phases of 120 volts, mm -hmm. and then one transformer could be powering two or three houses. Right or four right. or five, you know, you know, you're all right. the, all in the same transformer. Um, you know, I think that was a that was an, an issue back in the X10 days when uh, people were real close. You remember X10? I think it was X10. I can't remember the name of the technology that used the power line to send uh, control oh, signals. Fast was that it? Yeah, I can't remember. X10, I, maybe, X10, I think, and fast were. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so there were issues where sometimes, you know, if you had an X10 system, your neighbor had an X10 system, if you happen to be on the same channel, they would push the button to turn off a light and would turn it off in your house because we're all in the same, we're all in the same. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. Yeah. So in case in point, if you're having an issue in your own home, it may not actually be in your own home emanating from your own home. That, that is, that is correct. That is yeah. absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah.
well, we, we've got data that points to it. And, you know, a lot of times what's the most interesting is just when we see or hear about two homes close together and they're experiencing very similar symptoms, vents typically very quickly suggest that, you know, this kind of sounds like it could be utility related. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's been an interesting yeah. phenomenon. More and more it comes up. So yeah. Hmm. Okay. So so Todd, you know, you 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 kind of started off the conversation with, you know, you know, you know, we wanted to talk about MOVs and how you 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 deal with surge. I kind of thought the best place to start was to kind of define what a surge is, because um there's a, a lot of times the word surge and overvoltage are used you know, synonymously, and they're really not right. Uh, to me, a, a surge and an overvoltage are two, uh, two different things. So here is a um, a, a graphic that 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 uh, um, you know that kind of shows. You, you see the, the 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 you know the sine wave there. You know that that nice uh, undulating uh, wave there. Mm -hmm. That's the target. That's the 120 volt you know sine wave that we're looking for out of power. When you get these instantaneous changes in voltage level, right, where, you know, sometimes we call them spikes because they look at light spikes. Sometimes they're called transients, right? Just kind of depends. I mean, all these are, are interchangeable words, uh, you know, spikes, transients, surges. Um, what they mean is an instantaneous, very high level, high voltage uh, change, uh, you know, in, in the voltage level. Now, you know, in this graph, um, you know, these are relatively low level ones. Um, you know, in reality, a, a lightning strike can can create a 6,000 volt, 3,000 amp, uh, 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 you know, surge, a waveform, right? And, um, uh, uh, you know, you know, so the, the ones that are due to lightning, you know, kind of have one event, one, one, you know, one single spike. Mm -hmm. um, other things that cause surges, or these are these transients is when uh, the power company switches, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, does some grid switching. Um, you know, sometimes there's an issue and and uh, you know out on the grid and the power company has to redirect power and get it to your house in a different path than normal. So they're doing switching, uh, uh, you know, uh, from time to time, and that can uh, add these transients. Um, the other way that these transients get, uh, you know, put onto our system um, is like I uh, mentioned before, when uh, inductive motors turn on and off, um, you get these transients uh, that are more oscillatory. You can see that they're, you know, kind of jagged, the one, you know, on the, that's shown there on the right, mm -hmm. um, you know, motors, vacuum cleaners, you know, even though vacuum cleaners are, you know, normally plugged in at, a, at an outlet, you know, I've had I've had integrators, you know, tell me, you know, I had a subwoofer, you know, a powered subwoofer plugged into an outlet. And then my wife came or the customer's wife, you know, somebody plugged in a uh, a, a vacuum cleaner to the same outlet as the powered subwoofer. And they turned it on and it blew the subwoofer up. And it was because it, wow. the, the vacuum cleaner was putting a big surge right onto that circuit right directly. You know, so, you know, you know. So that kind of leads to the question, what, you know, what can we do? You know, what, what, what are the, what are the tools at our disposal to, to kind of protect against these surges? Uh, and I'll get back to this, this one uh, uh, in a second, but, you know, the two main, um, uh, um, you, uh, you know, you know, tools that we have, right, is, you know, a standard MOV, a metal oxide varistor, uh, or the, the, you know, the more advanced, and frankly, more expensive, right? You get what you pay for. More expensive, sure. uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, way of doing it, which is uh, is the advanced series mode, uh, you know, from Surgex. You know, the 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 you know the MOV, you know, did great work in in its time. You know, you think about what is what is an MOV, a metal oxide varistor. Uh, metal oxide refers to the fact that it is a semiconductor. Um, uh, 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 a varistor is a variable resistor. Mm -hmm. What you know, that's that's you know how it got its name. It was designed in the 70s, right? Um, it was it was always from the get go designed to reduce that surge peak at, uh, magnitude. It was never really intended to eliminate surge, right? Uh, it was designed to divert the 
the surge energy. And I have a graphic uh, coming up that, that I'll, I'll define what I mean by that. Um, and it was designed to sacrifice itself, right? It's like if we can have a device that, you know, that cost, you know, a, you know, a nickel and it sacrifices it, itself and it saves the life of my, uh, you know, a uh, $1,000 uh, uh, preamp processor, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, that's, yeah, it's a good trade-off, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so, so that's what it was designed to do. And again, they're not very expensive components, which in turn means they're not very precise. You know, most of them that are used in surge protection devices have a plus or minus 20% tolerance, right? Wow. Which is not, again, not a, not the most, uh, 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 you know, exact device out there. Uh, so when you look at the anatomy of an MOV based surge suppressor. This is this is normally how they are hooked up, right? So the MOVs uh, go, they're, they're hooked up between line and neutral and neutral and ground and line and ground. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, Todd, that everybody knows that, you know, a power, you know, signal, the three prongs on your, uh, uh, you know, on your outlet, one is line, which is the voltage, one is neutral, which is the return path. Mm -hmm. And then one is ground, which is a, it was put, you know, the, you know, you know, some of us that are old like me, you know, remember when there was a two pronged outlet or if you oh, bought sure. a house that was that was built before 1970. Yeah. had two prong uh, service uh, in the in, you know, around the time MOBs came around in the 70s. Um, the National Electric Code changed over to uh, a three prong uh, a system that uh, uh, included that ground connector. Uh, uh, yeah. So this is how MOBs are, are hooked up. You know, when you uh, when you have a. Um, a surge uh, that occurs um, when the surge, you know, uh, when that surge level goes to a certain, you know, a level that breaches the threshold of the of the MOV, the MOV kicks in and tries to divert that surge energy into ground. And as you can see on the output, which is on the right hand side there, it doesn't completely get rid of the surge. It it, it attenuates it, right? It reduces the level, but then get rid of it, right? And that is referred to as the let through voltage. And if you have an MOV based surge protector that has been UL uh, approved to the UL 1449 standard, and that's the, the standard for surge uh, protectors, UL will put on there a voltage protection rating that, v, that VPR is the amount of voltage that gets let through to the output if 6,000 volts are put on the input. A, hmm. a six thousand volt surge, not that not that the that the the sine wave is six thousand volt, but if that surge waveform uh, uh, gets up to six thousand, what is the output? And the and um, you know and that's you know that was an attempt by UL to kind of take some of the snake oil out of the surge protection industry, and to say, okay, uh, we're going to test these things. We're going to make sure that they don't cause a fire. That was one of the, one of the directives that UL had. We want to make these things safe, and also we want to let you know what you're paying for. And you know how, how low can that voltage uh, uh, go? Okay. Okay. We sure. should we should make note that the reason we've mentioned six thousand volts, three thousand amps a few times, you know, and and one time in the same sentence as lightning, which we know could be hundreds of thousands, if not into the millions of volts. Right. Um, well, Romex in the home uh, tends to come apart after you hit six thousand volts, three thousand amps. So. We care about that because that is something we can control for. Okay. If it's more than that, we've probably got other issues to resolve. <laughs> right. yeah. For yeah. Sure. Sadly, sadly. And, yeah. And, and that's kind of the standard that the testing agencies have kind of uh, uh, um, settled on as a what is a likely surge that can hit a, a, a electrical service, right? Okay. And, you know, it's like, you know, you, and, and Jimmy's absolutely correct. Surges can go higher than six thousand volt, but like you know, what is likely you know you know to, to hit you know so, um, you know and you know when one of the you know the things that is a is a detriment to the way that um, that some MOV uh, uh, base surge protectors are are set up is that they utilize that ground bus as a place to dump this surge energy, hmm. and the problem is is that when that surge energy gets dumped into ground. There's a possibility, depending on how the load equipment is is designed, there's a possibility for that surge energy to 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 go into that load and to cause a lockup, right? And again, it doesn't happen on every piece of equipment. 
and and, it, and as much as anything, it 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 has to do with the the voltage potential that gets created between neutral and ground when that surge uh, occurs in the in the in the and it's you know I'm trying to simplify it as much as I can, but it, it's just kind of simple simpler to kind of uh, uh, talk about it this way. Uh, a lot of times these surge these MOV based surge uh, devices, while they um, uh, protect the equipment uh, and they may sacrifice themselves, they might cause a lockup, right? And we we see that quite a bit where yeah the the, the equipment was saved, but uh, you know it got locked up and and still requires a truck roll and a reboot, right? From your for from sure your technician. I guess also if it doesn't cause a lockup, it's still kind of nicking away at the uh, overall life of the product. Yeah, right? that is absolutely right, and that, 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 lead, that, that is contributing to that premature failure statistic that we talked about. Before we jump into the series mode, I, I have a question from a viewer, but I also have a question uh, for myself. Uh, for myself, I'm wondering what percentage of surge protectors on the market are MOV based? I mean, are we talking 90, 95%, 99%? Taking a swag, I would say yes. If you look at the, the breadth of uh, surge products available, protection products available, yeah, at, at all your um, home improvement stores and retailers and online, yeah, I would say there's, there's at least 10 brands I could name off the top of my head that are reputable brands that we would all probably know that are MOV based. Okay. You know? And then, and then there's just a few, a limited few that are not MOV based. Okay. Yeah, there's a couple of there's a couple out there that that have you know both in their line, both MOV based and you know. Good point. Yeah. You know, and and, and you know, and and a higher you know a higher end a line, you know, but you know for price, most people are gravitating towards MOV because of price, which is unfortunate because it's not doing a. She's not doing the, the best job in the world of uh, of protecting your equipment. For and sure. Then, well, and those are typically brands too that lead heavily with uh, marketing. And, and I'm not saying that in the residential AV space. I'm just saying if you walk the aisles of a store and you're in the aisle of the protection area, you know, surge protectors, you'll see all kinds of claims like world's greatest, you know, protector of all surges for $9.99. You're thinking, how could that even be possible? Right. You know, and then you see a UL stick and you're like, wow, I feel safe. Um, oh, and not to, sure. say yeah. that, not to say there's anything wrong with UL putting something on there. Is it probably passed the test, whatever. But, you know, it just, to me, um, yeah. there's, diff there's different levels of, yeah. So, so right, Jimmy, yeah, and I've been there. I've that's been right. that guy looking at that stuff. So, so Jimmy, when, when you're walking through the store and you see that MOV base surge protector and you see that it's UL, look on the label and see what the voltage protection rating is because there's some out there that the voltage protection rating exceeds 800 volts or 900 volts. Yeah, that actually you're right. You're absolutely right. I have seen that. And, yeah. and, and I would guess that the average consumer is probably not thinking too much about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said, as long as it's uh, got a UL sticker on it, I'm good. But the yeah, UL, is, yeah, you, UL is telling you, Hey, this isn't the best one out here, <laughs> you know, but, if, but, I bet, but I bet if we said, Hey, would you plug your Samsung TV into an outlet that had 600 volts in it? You know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Gary Brown, uh, a viewer of ours, uh, is asking about whole house surge protectors, which I know you had said there's MOV and the, the, uh, series, um, mode, um, protectors or technologies, but how about the whole house uh, protectors? I love them and we recommend them. Uh, we, we've got a favorite company as a matter of fact. And I, honestly, I don't even know, I guess it's just the name stuck in my head back, uh, back in the day. And a guy named Tim over at uh, transient protection design. I think I send Vince and I both, we probably send a customer every two weeks at least to talk to Tim about a TVSS system for the whole house. Hmm. And we do get questioned by homeowners as well saying, hey, do I really need your stuff if I have this whole home protector? And we say, yeah, actually, you want both. 20% of surges, somewhere thereabouts, are going to come from outside the home, from the service side, right? Or or maybe uh, magnetically, events could talk more to this, uh, from lightning around the area, but entering through the service side of the home. That's okay. where that really comes into play. 80% okay. of surges are coming from within your home. All those things that Vince mentioned earlier, 
those inductive motors and your appliances and et cetera, they're, they're causing havoc. It's just, it's not a hundred thousand volts. It's a little bit at a time, you know, all the time. So uh, that makes sense. So the whole home is protecting from what's coming, uh, coming in from the outside, so to speak. I, I, I call it coming in through the front door. Coming in uh, through the front door. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know, you 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 know, think of your your house as a castle, right? You you, you know, you have a you have a, a a moat around it and a big you know wall <laughs> around it, and and you've got the big gate in the front door. That's your electrical service coming in. Yeah, you 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 should definitely at the front door have adequate uh, protection just to knock it down, right? Because you know, six thousand volts could be coming in. Let's just take let's just take the top of that off, right? Let's just, you know, knock it down to a little bit. So to, to tell you the truth, when you're talking about service entrance and that's service entrance is what you call the electrical service coming into your house. Mm -hmm. So the service entrance, um, uh, 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 you know, that type of surge, uh, the first line of defense is the power company. They have surge arresters all over the grid, right? The second line of defense are these whole house. And what's really, um, I think, um, great is uh we we uh, uh you know we, we were told that the national electric code uh, coming up you know in in future uh, uh revisions is going to require whole house uh electrical systems on new builds now i haven't looked into the details uh, of that and i don't know if you know it, if it, it is completely approved and you know you know all that but you know it, it it's definitely coming down the pipe uh, uh you know that, that you're gonna you know see more and more whole house but that's just the second line of defense. The mm. third line of defense, Jimmy mentioned it already. It's the Romex cable that's in the wall. The Romex cable can only handle a certain amount. Think of that um, uh, in that surge that we see there right on the on the screen. If you if you if you looked at that from a frequency standpoint, that is an extremely high frequency signal. It is moving very fast up and back down. It's, it's you know ultra high frequency. Sure. Um, the Romex cable is not designed to support high frequency. It's like, what if you put HDMI over a Romex cable? It, it wouldn't go through, right? It's like right. it would. It would it, so the Romex cable not not being designed to to support high frequency helps you out a little bit. The bottom line is, at the outlet, you still need that at the outlet, you know, uh, catch all, right? That is going to be. Your, your, you know, the, the, the final line of defense uh, uh, on the thing. Um, so okay. I just described everything you needed for, for going through. Then you've got all the other things, you know, keypads, speakers that are going outside. There's a whole bunch of backdoor things that can, you know, that, that surge can get into a, into a house. Right. Okay. In fact, you mentioned speakers. I have a neighbor who had a lightning strike right onto speakers that were mounted on their porch uh, just about two years ago. Yeah, yeah. And, and the speakers, uh, the speakers have those copper wires running into an amplifier that's maybe in a rack or in a theater system in a you know home theater room or in a multi-purpose room connected to other gear. So mm -hmm. I know that I, I've been through this conversation so many times. Well, how on, how in the heck could a surge that hit my outdoor speakers affect my TV? Right. Well, it hit your amplifier, which is connected to your TV via HDMI. Right. right. The surge doesn't care where it goes; it just finds a path of least resistance on its way to ground, you know? So it, it's very interesting. And, and, you know, all this talk about protection, all we're doing is lowering our risk. We cannot, we cannot guarantee that by doing all this, there's no chance that you have zero failure. Right. You, know, but you, you can mitigate your risk. We, there's a dealer of ours in Orlando, Florida with four homes that get hit almost every year. Wow. And over time, over time they've added to, you know, one home, got everything he recommended the next year they got hit instead of 40 grand of damage maybe it was five grand but the homes next to him still had 10 20 30 40 thousand dollars in damage all you can do is lower that risk mm -hmm. you know? yeah especially when you can't get parts now yeah it's not just the money. oh yeah for sure right now yeah. so todd i guess that leads us to what is surge x uh, uh answer or solution to to surge um you know, the Surge X solution is, um, uh, you know, it's been around for a while and it's it's proven itself, right? Uh, the heart of the system is uh, what's called a surge reactor. And actually I have one here so you can get a kind of a, 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 you know, 
can figure, you know, you can get, you know, see, you know, how the big scale it is. Of it, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's pretty, yeah, here actually, uh, let me see if you want to hold that up again. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a view. pretty hefty. So the whole surge, uh, 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 um, you know, component is not only this reactor, but this PC board behind it. So okay. that's doing the same thing that that little MOB that's the size of a coin is doing. Okay. Right. Okay. So inside that big metal can is two air core inductors. Okay. And uh, when, when AC goes through the entire system and there's no surge, it passes right through, everything's good. If there's any surge energy that's on that, that uh, AC waveform, what happens is through magnetic coupling, um, the the surge waveform because that's the high frequency part of it, and we know high frequencies, uh, you know, can uh, uh, you know go through capacitive, co you know, can be capacitively coupled to other things, right? Goes to that second inductor, and as you can see, that second inductor is wound backwards uh, compared right. to the first inductor. So right. what we actually do is we are creating a equal yet opposite surge waveform. Hmm. And then when you add that to the original waveform, you effectively notch out the surge and hmm. let the AC pass through. And it, it works very similar in, in theory to noise canceling headphones. Of course, noise canceling headphones are, you know, low level uh, audio signals, right? But it, you know, it has some, it has some similarities to, to that. I was just and, gonna say, yeah, it does. It looks like audio for sure. Yeah, yeah. So it, it it works. So what what that allows us to do is to 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 you know notch out that surge, right? It's got you know virtually zero let through volt voltage. Yeah, yeah, Jimmy. Well, and and without discontinuing your enjoyment of your system. And it's and it's a permanent. And that's important key right there. Oh no, it is. You know, and and Todd, we did this demo, so. Um, our equipment, you know, is sold, uh, you know, in, in many places. One of the places that our equipment is sold is uh, up at Sweetwater Sound, right? Uh, which is, you know, the, you know, the large on, online uh, music retailer. Sure. So uh, I, did, I did a demo for them up there, right? So we, were, we did the training up there. I had a uh, probably a uh, four or $5,000 guitar amplifier, boutique guitar amplifier and, uh, and a guitar. And uh, we brought our 6,000 volt surge generator uh, over there on stage and we hooked it up through a surge X piece and plugged the guitar amplifier in it and hit it with a 6,000 volt surge about 30 times while I was playing a really clean passage. Just, to, you know, wow. it's really, really clean guitar. You could hear nothing through the guitar amplifier, zero, hitting it with a 6,000 volt surge over and over and over again. So, and, and probably during the, you know, the two minute demo, you know, it probably got hit. Uh, no, it was, it was probably more like a 10 minute demo. It probably got hit, you know, 15, uh, uh, 15 or 18 times. But, you know, just to kind of point to the permanence of this solution, hmm. uh, if, if any of your uh, viewers have been to Cedia or Infocom in the last 12 years, you know, well, except for the COVID years, that we bring <laughs> Big Bertha and Big we, Bertha. Uh, we, we hit continuously all of our booth electronics the computer the monitors everything that we are presenting we're hitting it with a surge every 30 seconds for the entirety of the show hmm. and the you know the reality is when you pack up from a show you throw the, the surge generator in the flight case you throw the surge x piece in the same flight case that same surge x piece has been traveling with that demo to ISE, to Infocom, to Cedia, to regional trade shows for the past 12 years. Wow, that's really impressive. You know, and it just keeps on, keeps on keeping on. Yeah, for those of you watching it, it I know it's hard to visualize what this uh, machine looks like. I'm going to drop a link uh, down into our YouTube uh, video for you to watch later on. Uh, Jimmy, I believe it's of you at on the show floor at Cedia blowing up an MOV and then running the same uh, surge through uh, a surge X product, correct? Yeah, we love, right? we, we love doing that over all the years. Yeah, that yeah. sounds very familiar. Yeah. Yeah, so I've seen that in person. It's very impressive, but I'll drop a, a link down so everybody can can watch it. Uh, yeah. So you can get a, a idea of what it looks like. You know, and then and then the you know, the last thing is since we don't um, 
you know, we don't reference ground at all in our in our system, right? Where we are eliminating surge through cancellation. There's no need to dump anything into the ground bus, which is which is uh, which is great. Okay. So, so so what I like about that really quick is that we don't then, as an end user, have to go and reboot our stuff as often when a surge X piece is used at the forefront as opposed to an MOV based product. MOV based products shunt energy to ground. They can contaminate ground. And as mm -hmm. pointed to earlier, based on their design, if they do reference ground and need a zero reference point using ground to do that, if energy is on ground, they no longer see a zero or a one. Right. And that's when, of course, all digital equipment needs to reference, right? The logic circuits inside. And then the reason we've been promoting these uh, reboot devices all these years to get better at rebooting, maybe not rolling the truck, maybe be remote, use an app, whatever, mm -hmm. is because we keep finding ourselves with a growing list of products that now need to be rebooted. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just a, just a quick question for you guys. I noted uh, that you're calling it advanced series mode. What's the difference between advanced series mode and regular old series mode? So, um, Jimmy, you want to take this one? Well, I mean, sure. Uh, we've got one model that I know of that's still in the line that's a uh, series mode, and it's really because of the constraint of the size of the product. It's just under two inches off the wall. It's designed to go behind a TV. Mm -hmm. we'd, we'd be hard pressed to pick that piece up that uh, Vince showed us at Surge Reactor to put that in a box and still be under two inches, which is a general requirement of products that go behind the TV so you can mount it and have it still look like it's close to the wall. Sure. Right. Uh, so that piece still has series mode. Every other core Surge X product in the lineup is advanced series mode. That happened uh, around 10 years ago. So we, we truly have a uh, Surge elimination product today with advanced series mode. We can say we did then as well, and, and here's why. Um, we did let nominal amounts of voltage on to neutral. Uh, we didn't cancel out like we can do today with the opposing coil, but we let, we let nominal amounts of voltage over neutral over a period of time. It was so insignificant that the, the componentry that was connected, the load that would be connected, would not see surge energy coming in too. Okay. And, and, and you know, from a circuit standpoint, um, uh, um, a series mode is just one inductor, and the inductor is acting as a high frequency resistor because that's what an inductor is. You know, it's okay. a, a resistor for high frequency, and since a surge is a very high frequency, it's it's attenuating the surge. But with advanced series mode, since we have the two inductors and we're coupling it over, and we are canceling out the surge, it's a much more robust and much more effective system than the series mode. You know, when, when space is an issue, eh, series mode will get you by. Because the good thing about series mode, it's still a permanent uh, a technology, right? Where advanced series mode is also permanent technology, and we know MOV is not. OK. Perfect. Thanks. So so Todd, I thought we maybe, it looks like we have about 15 more minutes. Or, uh, you know, sure. uh, you know, we can go a little longer if you if you need us to go longer. But um, OK. Um, I wanted to, to kind of expand what we're talking about into um, other voltage issues or, or, or power anomalies that we come across, because we have a tool called Envision, which is a power monitoring device that uh, allows us to record voltages over time. And uh, what we have found through looking at hundreds and hundreds of Envision logs from all over the country. Um, what we find is that um, no matter where you are, our voltage fluctuates on a on a minute by minute basis, right? Um, uh, the power company's doing everything they can to, to, to make sure you get voltage. They sure as heck do not have the ability to make sure that it is stable, right? It, it fluctuates all over the place, right? Um, so, you know, you know, what we see are, you know, when, you know, so if you, if you look at the, the graphs that I got here, um, the red lines show what the target is, right? That is right. the amplitude that you're looking for. Sometimes you get over voltages. Sometimes you get under voltages. 
Uh, I have a, a situation here where at night my voltage creeps up to about 125 volts. Huh. Uh, when people are, you know, it's probably my neighbors, right? I know that, uh, you know, my transformer is sitting right there. I can see it from, from out my, outside my window right here. Uh, it's powering uh, uh, my house and three other houses. And, uh, you know, it must be that during during the day, somebody's using a bunch of energy because the voltage will, will go down to about 117 during the day and then creep up to about 125 at night. Still, both of those numbers are in bounds, but it kind of uh, uh, it illustrates that the voltage is not as stable as we think it is. OK, and we've seen that from from uh, data all over the country. So that leads to the to the question, what can you do about it? And um, uh, Jimmy has been very successful in in introducing the uh, uh, you know the residential AV community to the the uh, 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 you know, to a double conversion to online UPS. Uh, this is a special category of UPSs. Uh, there are many, you know, there are three main, predominantly three uh, uh, types of UPSs, a standby, a line interactive, and this double conversion online. This double conversion online, of course, the most expensive. However, there's a reason for that, right? Uh, what it does is it takes that AC coming in, and that AC can be varying all around, right? Plus or minus 15% or more. Uh, we have some models that can handle even a 30% a, a deviation in voltage level. The AC gets turned into DC in order to charge the batteries, but it's also powering the DC to AC circuit full time. Hmm. So that these double conversion online UPSs are actually acting as voltage regulators. And, and you know, okay. when, when we work with our integration partners, you know, we, we kind of tell them, it's like, I know we're using the words UPS. And when we say UPS, you're thinking, okay, uh, in, if the power goes out, then this thing will do its job. And we say, well, that's true. When the power goes out, this thing does its job. It, it will provide energy for a period of time where the batteries can, 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 can handle it. Mm -hmm. but, but really, the reason why you're using it is for this stability, right? And I think, Jimmy, you can, you can, you can vouch that for this. Our integration partners that have adopted this as their standard uh, uh, you know, piece of equipment, you know what? What do they say about about these these devices? Right, we we do, we go months without a single reboot, and it's not something that we present as a result everyone will see. It's just something that we hear so commonly that it's become almost ingrained to our presentation. You know, two to four to six months. It's crazy to think that people can go that long without a single reboot. And some of these yeah. extremely sophisticated jobs with highly sensitive electronics. I, I would purport that though, that this is probably the number one concern for us today. And I think it will become even more of a concern this year, next year, the year after, as more and more EV cars are adopted. Mm. Folks are going to be plugging these EV cars into their, you know, brand new circuits that they put into their uh, service entrance panel or their sure. sub panel by the garage. These circuits can be 20 amp, you know, if you don't mind a trickle charge that may take hours, long, long time, right. or, yeah, or you can that. get larger circuits and they can charge quicker. Sure. And this being America, I would think that most people are <laughs> going to vote for the quicker. Everybody's going quicker if yeah. they can. <laughs> and and so I, I, I feel like that's just going to compound the issues with not just our dealers and our dealers wanting to retain their reputations and, you know, keep that promoted um, but our end users who want to enjoy their systems without having to call somebody to come and reboot something or fix something that you know went premature end of life um, because neighbors all over are plugging their cars in and causing these voltage sags throughout the neighborhood and then voltage sags causing the products to fail prematurely For so sure. um, it, it, to me it's it's a since surge protection you know whatever, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20, 10 years ago, uh, that was a big thing. But regulation is the thing Vince and I are so focused on these days because that is what we see coming in from the field daily. Uh, you know, voltage drops mostly, but daily. We see it everywhere. 
And you guys are sure of this because you have this Envision uh, product. It's all it's all based on data. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And we're yeah. not saying we're not saying for sure that everyone needs this, right, Vince? We've we've told yeah. some folks, why don't we take a look at your power quality first, then see if you need this. And then also they're noisy. So they're not gonna be for everyone. You're not gonna put this in your living room. It's it's gonna be as loud as a small projector that you know might be 45, 50 dBA. Mm-hmm. But you know, if you're in an area, if you can put this in an area where you're not gonna hear it. It's the best thing you could do for your system. Yeah. Yeah. It's and, and, go ahead, Don. I was just going to say, I actually had uh, you guys sent out an Envision uh, a couple years ago, and I plugged it into my uh, an outlet that my uh, rack runs off of. And the report that kind of came back was, yeah, we don't really see any problems. So, yeah. yeah. It, but you know, Todd, the, the other thing that I that I talk about about the need for voltage stabilization. So. Um, you know, you were you're very gracious in, uh, in 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 you know telling everybody my background. So you know, before I was a, a sales engineer, I was a design engineer, mm-hmm. and and you know the the um, you know the way that engineers uh, uh, you know become engineers, right? We go to we go to college, uh, learn all the theory behind uh, uh, you know electrical engineering. You go to your first design job. And you're teamed up with a senior level engineer that has lots of experience and they kind of teach you how to design products right, right. so okay. i went through you know i worked at panasonic i worked at, at, at general electric uh, uh i worked for a small company that did movie theater audio equipment um you know i uh, um not one time when i was talking with my fellow engineers or working with my my engineering mentor did we ever say does this product work at 90 volts right if it was a 120 volt product we had a bench power supply that had a knob on it that we would dial in 120 volts and we would plug our device in and we would do everything we could to make the darn thing work at 120 volts not one time did anyone say, "Hey, what if we took the the the, the power supply, the, the 120 volts, and 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 move it around and and give it some wacky voltage, or give it a you know, let's see what it, let's see what happens when it runs at 90 volts for a period of time? Maybe there are designers out there that go, or you know companies that do that, but not at any of the ones that I ever worked for, right? So it it you know we know that the equipment is designed to work at 120 volts. That's what we, you know, it's, and when you give it a voltage other than that, there's going to be a window that, yes, it'll work within this window. But if it goes way outside of this window, all bets are off, right? And, 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 and you know, this is the reason why when Jimmy introduced this double conversion online UPS, using it as a voltage regulator in these sophisticated systems, the uh, service calls went way down. And they continue to go way down. And we have loyal customers that say, you know, I'm just going to put it on any on every job. You know, yeah. I'm just going to do it. I'm just, yeah. And Todd, to Jimmy's way, point, we're we're going to see more and yeah. more of these issues arise as things like EVs are. Yeah. Keep that in mind, Todd, because you have an Envision. If you still have it, plug it I back don't. in if it's not already. Okay. Well, no, things you guys can have change. It. Things can change. You know, it, yeah. it could have been the two years ago you had no issues. Uh, we have new homes that go in. Uh, everything's fine. Dealer says six months later, some crazy stuff goes on. Oh, uh, two more homes went in, right? Uh, as things get added to the grid in your neighborhood, in your general area, it can impact your uh, power. It's not It's not rock steady. It's not static. It's always dynamic. It's changing so all just, the time. Yeah. Well, where does this particular product typically go? Does it go out near your breaker panel or? Yeah. So there's different sizes, you know, it, it, it can, it's, it's as small as under a couple thousand dollars. You, you put it on uh, a system for the family room. If you can get it in an area where you don't hear it, okay. you can put it in a rack of gear that drives your house at uh, 20 amps, maybe at 1800 Watts. If you have more stuff, you're going to feed a panel maybe driving your lighting load. Maybe mm-hmm. another one will be used for just the audio video load, including the big projector or the video wall. You know, it's it's all over. And, and really we, we rely on 
Vince's expertise on specifically larger scale systems to figure out what is the best approach. Okay. But, but generally speaking, we'll put these 10 KVA UPSs in their own siloed compartments. So a sub panel that has maybe some very mission critical uh, areas of the home, like the wine chiller and different appliances and the sump yeah. pumps and the koi ponds. And then another sub panel for lighting loads because nobody wants their lights flick flickering or they, they want to be sure the lights are on whenever there is a power outage. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, our AV, uh, because it's so sensitive, our AV load for sensitive AV there. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Light flickering. I've experienced that every once in a while in our home for sure. So yeah. um, there you go. Uh, typically when you hear UPS in, in the home theater world, it's people talking about uh, rigging one up with their projector just in the event of a power outage, keeping enough power to go, you know, feed into it to keep it going so you can shut it down properly. But this sounds like this is something for a much bigger job. Yeah. You know, and I mean, whereas maybe that was the entry point, mm -hmm. right? That, that's where it started to, to, to get in. We have, all right. So I didn't really explain it too well, but the, the, the two UPSs that you see there, uh, the white one that's on the left, that's a large format UPS. Okay. It's floor standing, very high power, uh, uh, 10,000 watts. Uh, and like Jimmy uh, had, had mentioned, uh, the, that is hardwired in by an electrician. And the output of that UPS goes to its own critical load breaker panel, and which is really convenient because now you can have all of your AV loads, not only the ones coming from your rack, but all of the remote televisions, right? If, if it's a new build, it's mm -hmm. a new house, right? You can just say, okay, I want the, you know, the, uh, 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 you know, all of the television circuits to go back, uh, you know, to this particular panel. So now everything that that the integrator is uh, responsible for, as far as the AV system is concerned, is now completely protected, right? And uh, there's one more actually uh, uh, attribute that that large UPS has that the small one. So the one on the right uh, is actually stood up on its end. That is a two rack unit uh, UPS shown oh. with a uh, with, with a with a, uh, a battery extension cabinet. So Got the it. one that you can kind of see the blue LCD on there, that's sure. a, that's a that's a two RU unit uh, that could go in the bottom of the rack. Oh, uh, and then if you need thing. more capacity, you've got that battery on there. But mm -hmm. uh, but the the one on the uh, on the left, the white one, has internally to uh, on it what's called an isolation transformer. And an isolation transformer is a wonderful tool to lower the no noise floor. So not only is the UPS regenerating the power and giving you this perfect, uh, 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 you know, uh, um, you know, very low distortion, uh, 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 highly regulated, um, uh, you know, power signal, you are magnetically isolating it through the use of a, a transfer. So why do you need one? Well, you know, when you when you know, let's say your breaker panel was in you know, on one end of the house and your home theater was clear, you know, uh, uh, on the other end of the house. What you have is these long wire runs. And whether you know it or not, you know, inside the main breaker panel, the neutral wire and the ground wire are actually connected together. Right. And in electrical terms, when you when you have a neutral and or if you have two wires that are connected together, the voltage between them theoretically should be zero. But what okay. happens is when you get these really long wire runs because your panel is on one side of the house, your theater is on the other side of the house. Yes, I'll put a dedicated 20 amp circuit right for my AV system, but it's on a really long wire. Well, you'll get a voltage drop across it. And not only you'll get a voltage drop, you can see that when I measure the voltage between neutral and ground, I'll actually get a voltage between there. That is not something that is uh, uh, advantageous to a lot of, of, of sensitive electronics. That okay. neutral to ground voltage uh, is responsible for, for for noise, which manifests itself as as equipment, uh, you know, getting locked up, or could manifest itself as audible noise in a in a in a uh, in a reference uh, audio system. Mm -hmm. You know, so what can you do about it, right? Well, you know, I, I'm not going to move the breaker panel, but even if I did, I still got the same you know the uh, uh, problem. You can put in an isolation transformer. When when you include an isolation transformer, it allows us to to legally 
conforming to the National Electric Code, establish a new neutral to ground bond. So let's say you have your theater on the far end of the house. Most theater, uh, theaters these days will have a dedicated equipment room that has all the racks of equipment in it, right? Mm -hmm. We'll park that, or I'll, I'll suggest that they park that large format UPS in that equipment room, right? Where it's, it's sound uh, isolated. Um, you'll put the critical load panel right there in that, in that room. Now, what that means is I have a neutral to ground bond or are shorting together those neutral and ground wires, all the noise goes away, right? It's it's a it's a great system. Jimmy, t tell them about the experience you just had uh, well, with that large format with, with that client that you uh, or you know with that dealer in his showroom. Well, in general, when we speak of UPSs, we tend to throw them all in the lump sum, you know, generalize, and we say, oh, don't ever plug an amplifier into a UPS. Right. And generally speaking, if it's a rack mount of UPS from us, we're going to say, don't plug an amplifier into that. It's the surefire way to make sure we impede the load so the amplifier is choking for current. So we, we had a large format UPS that went into a theater. It was a nice theater. I think it retailed for right around a half a million dollars. Um, reference gear all over. Amplifiers like crazy, uh, taking up almost an entire full rack. And it was... Uh, uh, one of our large format UPS is driving the entire system, the projector, the entire rack of gear, actually two racks of gear. And I asked the, the integrator, um, you know, what have you noticed since you put the UPS in? And the answer I got, although it was um, maybe not as impressive as the answer I was looking for, it was the best answer. He said, I haven't noticed any current limitation with the huh. amplifiers. And and that was that was beautiful because... They were, it was a CAT system, and CAT is such a demanding amplifier. Um, to have him say that he didn't feel like the amps were starved at all, and, of course, he played us some incredible demonstrations. Um, it was Smart Home Automation in Hawaii, by the way, and, and Matt and his team put an amazing theater demonstration together. Um, the Barco video was incredible. It's, it's one of the best I've seen. It was matched with uh, Mad VR, which is a newer thing that if you haven't seen it yet, you got to get one if you've got a nice projector. Yeah. And and the the UPS helps with all that audio and video detail to come through. That's what I feel like. The the video is going to uh, look better. And I'm not going to say that it's the UPS improving the video. It's the UPS providing a nice, clean, and stable power signal so that that gear can shine. Sure. Makes sense. Definitely. It lets, it lets the year be the best it can. But then tell them about the noise on the uh, on the audio. Oh, so we went through about five or six demos, and they were all extremely loud. We started with something that was, you know, not very in your face, uh, like Hotel California or something like that from the Eagles. We went into some movie scenes, and we ended with Metallica. Super loud. I love Metallica. He knew that. And, <laughs> and we went from, you know, well over 100 dB of audio that he hit mute and he said, do you hear that? And there wasn't a sound and it was absolutely awesome. He said, you no know, buzz. No, nothing, we used huh? to have a hiss in this room when I would do that for customers and reestablishing that neutral to ground bond really helped with, you know, deadening any noise that we had on that power line. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, subwoofers are particularly prone to letting that kind of noise shine through. Um, I know people are always trying to chase down problems with those, but wow, what kind of uh, what kind of price does that uh, type of product go for? We're we're just under twenty three thousand dollars for the unit, and mm -hmm. then you look into you know labor costs for the install, and sure. and again, it's it's common for us to see a couple pieces, and and even more now we're seeing two to four pieces for a project, so um, it's not just always one. Um, but if it is, you know, we'll let you know, like, hey, this can get it done or or it can't because we're trying yeah. to we're trying to reach out to too many things. Sure. You know, yeah. you know sure. a, a lot of times, you know, with the, the conversation starts with, you know, I've got this very expensive theater, you know, and we add up, you know, how much power what the power budget is. It's like, OK, you're definitely in the in the large format category. And then and then the, and then the, our integrator partner will say, OK, well, give me all the information that I need to be able to sell this to the homeowner. And we, we give them all that information. And then the, the integrator says, Oh, wait a minute. I forgot. I got, I'm doing the lighting in this thing. Will this be good? He's like, yeah, 
so what's great is now you have a different one for your lighting. And since it's got those isolation transformers in them, they're completely isolated. So now your lighting load doesn't affect anything on the other load. So they go through and they, 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 you know, convince the homeowner. Yeah, we need this for the lighting. We need one for the, uh, for the AV system. And then the homeowner will say, I just spent $30,000 on a sub-zero refrigerator and about $6,000 or $4,000 on my Bosch uh, dishwasher. Yeah. Uh, what do we do out of those? Well, we can, we can get you another one. And, oh, oh yeah, I've got, I've got, uh, I got, uh, uh, you know, $80,000 in wine in the, uh, in the wine cellar. What do I do for the cooler on that? You know, and you, and you think about that, Todd, you think about that. It's not just the money for the fridge, right? And it yeah. could be the money for the wine, but also the fact that you bought bottles of wine, you can never replace the age of right. them, whatever it is, right? Where you found sure. them. And and so it's not just the money, it's the time it takes to replace, especially now, the time it takes to replace these parts. Oh, oh yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, just having a repair guy come out, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the fees associated with that. And yeah. like you say, you might not even be able to repair what you have. And and, uh, and, and I think this is my last uh, uh, slide, Todd. Sure. It, it just wanted to kind of to to to, you know, the one the one thing that we we get a lot is a, a misunderstanding of what a UPS capability is. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, we'll say, hey, uh, uh, the customer wants a UPS. OK, how much time do you need it to last? Oh yeah, I think uh, they wanted like 12 to 18 hours. It's like, well, that's not a UPS. <laughs> UPS is <laughs> UPS is like 20 minutes. They like 30 minutes. Uh, you know, we can put enough battery capacity on there to to you know. There are battery systems out there that are intended for longer, but these are you know walls and walls of batteries. You know, to to, to get you there. Yeah, what you really want is a generator on premises for your consistent source of, of backup energy, right? Because you're, you're running off of a fossil fuel, most likely natural gas or diesel or something, depending on where you're, you're located. Let the generator do the backing up of the power, but let us be the thing that cleans up the, the, the so there's two parts to, to, to the, you know, the, the generator scenario. So I put this kind of timeline together. So you're going from left to right. You're sitting here. You're on grid power. Everything's good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, yeah, and then the power goes out, all right? Well, the, the, the generator, if you don't have a UPS on there, is going to take you know 15 seconds, 30 seconds to, to, to detect and to come up to speed. And then when it finally comes up to speed, you're going to get this incredible transient because everything in your house is on and has been starved of, of, of power. When that generator comes on, it, it puts an incredible transient that's similar to a surge. It is actually a surge. You know, it puts that on there. And okay. then you're on backup generator until the power comes back on and then you have a switch over, another transient event, and now you're back on grid power. When you're on backup power, you know, you, Todd, you mentioned those LED light bulbs. Sure. Yeah. Every time my system switches over to backup power, all of the LED light bulbs in the in the house, they kind of waver, they kind of flicker, you know. Especially the ones on the dimmer. When you start dimming them and down, they it, 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 it's you know kind of gives you the the, the heebie-jeebies, right? You know, yeah. you know. Um, when you when you team a double conversion online UPS up with a generator, it's the perfect solution because you you, you know you'll have an automatic transfer switch with the generator system that switches between grid power and backup power. Mm -hmm. you, you put the the UPS downstream of that, right? You put it, you put it, you know. So now we are conditioning the grid power. We are protecting during transition, keeping systems up and running during transition. We're eliminating the surge event that's that's going on, and it's really proven to be a necessity. People, you know, some integrators say, well, I got a generator. I don't need the, the UPS. No, you need the UPS more than ever if you got a generator. Interesting. Yeah. It makes total sense. You're getting complete coverage uh, without those gaps. Yep. Awesome. All right. Well, 
Well, guys, we're running up on an hour. We're actually over an hour. Um, I told you I had one last question. I was going to have one last question for you, and that is just a, a parting piece of advice for folks uh, you know, who may not be in the market for uh, a super expensive series mode uh, surge protector. You know, if you're, if you're only able to afford say a uh, hundred bucks for a surge protector, you know, what should you be looking for? I mean, you've mentioned looking at the UL rating. Uh, is there anything else? Uh, yes. The consumer I, I, should I, be looking at. Yeah. So, so the, the, the things that I would look at is, is, is read the label and see what the voltage protection rating is and make sure the lowest that that UL will put on the voltage protection rating is 330 volts. So it's funny, our device has a voltage protection rating of 330, mainly because they didn't know what to do with zero. It's <laughs> like, okay, it's like the lowest number we got on the chart is 330. We, we didn't know that people could get lower than that. So we're actually 330, even though we're, we're, we're zero. But look at for because it, there's some that'll be 330, some be 400, some will be five, six, seven, eight. Get one with the lowest number. The other thing that you want to look for is one that has an LED on it that tells you when the surge protection device or the MOV is blown up. Ah. Because there's a lot of them out there that will continue to pass power even if the MOV is blown up. Interesting. So, yeah. so it turns into basically a glorified power strip. Absolutely. Yeah, or, or worse, guys, I've seen videos on YouTube where it continued to pass power. And the next time a surge came through, it was not good. Yeah. You, you'll see burnt marks on carpet and under the, you know, yeah. melted, molded plastic. You know, it's it can be scary. So I, I agree with you, Vince. You got to have a light to show you that it's working. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. And I mean, a lot of folks, you know, when, when it comes to wanting to spend money like on your home theater system, the least sexy thing is a surge protector. Right. You want to put. I was wondering in. if anyone would want to listen to this damn broadcast because of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but in truth, it's almost one of the most sexy things. But you know what I mean? It's like, you know, when you yeah. think about, well, I've got this budget for this month, mm -hmm. you know, I can get a little bit, bit better of a receiver. Well, you really do need to think about how you're protecting what you have. Right. Absolutely. I mean, so yeah. don't cheap out. I'm... And, and no, Todd, you're right. Because the thing is, you could spend a hundred dollars, you could spend four hundred dollars, and it only does the surge protection part of it only does its job if you get a surge. Right. And and there's you know, it's it Jimmy hit the nail on the head before when he talked about it. it's about mitigating risk. You know, if you live in South Florida, you better get one. Yeah. Yeah. You, if you live there, if you live in the Midwest, in the plain states, there's something about the, the way that the, the magnetic fields of the earth work, you can Google it and you can see where the lightning hot spots are. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I, I hate buying something that doesn't do anything, right? It's just <laughs> sitting there not doing anything. But boy, do I feel stupid being in the surge protector business. <laughs> I get a surge and it's like, ah, I didn't put a, I didn't put a freaking surge X on that thing. And <laughs> it has happened. It has happened where I have lost something because I've just like, I was just, I didn't think about it. It's like, or, you know, you, you told about my background. I've worked for many surge protection companies and I have my old products on some of my stuff, which is not as good as surge elimination. And mm -hmm. I got, I had something that blew up. It's like, damn it, I had the old thing on there. I didn't have the new thing. You know? <laughs> yeah. Easy to understand how you could fall victim to that because, you know, it's not something you're, I mean, well, you guys might be thinking about it on a daily basis, but most folks aren't. They get up in the morning, you know, they put their pants on, they go about their day, not considering what's happening to all of the electronic devices that they've spent so much money on in their home. So. Absolutely right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, when, guys. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jim. Oh, when, when we think of protection, we're going to think about it most after after we've been hit, right? Yeah. Yeah. After something's yeah. occurred, then oh, now it's front of mind. Yeah. And and yep. Todd, I know we've gone over, and and you know we could probably do so much more because Vince and I are so freaking passionate about what we do. So we really appreciate the outlet to give us an opportunity to 
I'll call it vent at the end of the day. We don't get to do this all day. Talk about <laughs> what's exciting in the world of power. Yeah. Um, we address problems all day long and, and try to forecast ahead and look at problems that might occur and put plans together. Um, but this is definitely fun. Thank you so much for allowing us thank, to do Well, this. and thank you. Thank you so much for coming on and taking the time tonight to, uh, to hang out with me and talk shop. And I hope I get to see you guys at Cedia this year. I'm planning on coming. Assuming uh, the world doesn't fall completely apart again, but uh, yeah, sure. hopefully I can pop by and say hi and shake your hand. Please um, do, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and look out, look look out for the the CE Pro All Star Band. I'm 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 playing in the band and getting the band back together for the show, baby. Awesome, can't wait. All right, all right, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, so folks, if you uh, want to learn more about Surge X products. Head over to the website. I'm sure it's surgex.com. Yeah, ESP yep. surgex.com. Yes. Yeah, and, and I think surgex.com gets you there too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I'll, I, I'll I highly through. recommend you go check it out. And uh, aside from that, if you have any questions, you can always find me on AV Nirvana. And if I can't answer that question, I'll ask one of these guys and to uh, get some uh, clarity and pass it along to you. So cool. uh, thanks very much, guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Okay, have Thank a great you. night. All right. If you enjoy content like this, hit like, subscribe, and then join the conversation on avnirvana.com.